We have been, um, we've been in a series, and uh, this is one of the favorite series that I've ever preached because I just think it's really vital for us to understand how to experience the overflow of God's blessing in our lives. We started the series off by talking about that we don't wait till we're filled up to be poured out. When we're emptied out, when we're pouring ourselves out into uh, what they call these desolate pots, remember the story from 2 Kings? When we're pouring ourselves out into the desolation of the world, we take that initiative. We don't wait till we're all filled up. We pour, we, we pour ourselves out from our emptiness. We, uh, we see that God supernaturally supplies uh, what we need. And I've seen that over and over again. We've talked about how uh, on the mission field, at the point of exhaustion, you just give yourself and God takes care of that. We talked about how important it is to understand God's math that we, uh, we cannot have the experience of God's overflow in our lives if we do it alone. We talked about two are better than one. They have a greater return for their labor and how important it is to be working together for the cause of Christ. And then last week we talked about how important it was to be a fit vessel. That is to be cleansed, to be holy, to be sanctified, to, to, to be cleansed of the junk of this world and the sin that's in our heart so that we're ready like a dish on the shelf ready to be used for God's purpose. And today I want to talk to you about an extremely important subject that we don't hear much about. All right, are you ready today? And so please, I'd encourage you to take notes today. There are going to be five simple things that I want to give you so that you might experience the overflow in your life. Now before we do that, I want to take you to 2 Kings chapter 18. 2 Kings chapter 18. Are you ready? All right, if you don't have your Bible, there's one in front of you in the pew. 2 Kings chapter 18 begins with a prophet named Elijah. Elijah was one of the great men of God in the Bible. And, and one of the highlights of his ministry is right here in 2 Kings 18. I call this the barbecue showdown. All right? This is the barbecue showdown. Elijah is living in a country where Ahab is the king and his wife Jezebel is the queen. Now, any of you named your lovely little daughter Jezebel, thank you for not doing that. And, and thank you for not naming your son Ahab because these were evil leaders. And, and the nation was evil, which produced evil leaders, which reproduced evil in the nation. It was a vicious cycle. And that's where Elijah finds himself in Israel. And it's a time where people are abandoning God or, or at least or at least taking biblical true worship and, and combining it with all these false gods and false worship. By the way, that continues to happen today in our churches, where we take the true biblical worship, the true biblical theology and doctrine, and we water it down, and we take and pick and choose what we want, and we throw away the rest. And then we bring in the philosophies of the world of the day because they're popular. And we blend all that together in trying to be appeasing and acceptable to the world. That's what was happening in Israel. And so Elijah's a prophet crying out to Israel to come back to the Lord. And you'll see what he says here. He says, listen, if Baal is God, then follow Baal. But if Yahweh is God, then follow Yahweh. You can see that in 1821. But at the point, the people didn't commit. They wouldn't say one way or the other. They, they wanted some kind, of, some kind of sign. And so Elijah and these prophets of Baal and Asherah, by the way, there were 450 false prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah. How many of you ever feel outnumbered in this world 850 to 1? 850 to 1, all right? Uh, this, this, is, this is a lonesome feeling. He's there all by himself. He is in extreme danger, the king, the queen, all these 850 prophets, and most of the people want his voice silenced. They don't want to be convicted of their sin. They certainly don't want to leave behind the comforts that come from worshiping these false gods. And so, so he says, hey, why don't, why don't we do this? Let's have a showdown. And so he's saying, basically, I'll take on all 150 of you. Reminds me of Fred Sanford, right? And so, and so that sounds crazy, doesn't it? How many of you would take on 850 people by yourself? Kids, how many of you would stand up to your whole class to do what's right? Or you'd go into your workplace and you'd proclaim this is what's righteous. Or 
or you'd be in your, in your book club or, or in your organization and you'd say, hey, I'm going to take a stand. And so the people agreed to this barbecue showdown. Let me just tell you what this barbecue showdown was. It wasn't Pitmaster where they're build, doing ribs. He said, let's take animals and let's cut them up and let's put them on an altar. And the prophets of Baal and Asherah can try to call down fire from their gods to consume it. And I'll see if my God will call down fire. Now, by the way, because God was so angry at, the, at, the, at Israel, they had been in a drought for three years. No rain for three years. You would think that they would turn to God after having no rain for three years, but they didn't. I don't know about you, but I look at our culture, our society today, you'd think they'd turn to God because we have a mess going on in our hands, don't we? We can't even watch a football game now in peace. And our politicians are, are, are crazy, and, and, and everything's going on, and it's a mess. And, and, and we have a crazy man in, in North Korea who's ready to put his finger on a button and, and shoot nuclear weapons at us. And we live in a mess, and yet are people turning to God? No, they're not. And so we need Elijahs in the world today. We need mighty men and women of God who will take a stand, who will be warriors for the Lord. So Elijah said, let's have this barbecue showdown. The people said, hey, that sounds like a good idea. So, so the priests of Baal prepared their their offering, and they built the altar, and they, they called on their gods to deliver down fire. Bring down fire! And nothing happened. You know why, don't you? Because they're not real. We have so many people calling on fake gods today to bring blessings in their life, and there's no overflow in their life because their gods aren't real. Whether it's a fake God or some sort of secular philosophy, it won't bring blessing. Elijah, Elijah is a funny character. He's over here watching these 850 prophets crying out to their God, and he goes, Maybe your God's asleep! <laughs> if that's not bad enough, he said, Maybe your God's busy! And then this one really gets me. If you look in the original language, this is really what it says. Maybe your God's using the bathroom. This is not a guy that lacks courage. This is a guy that is full of God's Holy Spirit. He is on fire. He is confident about what the Lord can do. And he's fixing to show them the power of God. Well, he chides them on, and the prophets of, pre, of Baal and Asherah, they cut themselves with spears and swords, and there's blood all over them trying to get the attention of their God. But there is no attention because there is no God. And so finally, it's his turn. And he says, build the altar, put the, put the offering on the altar, and now start pouring jars of water. And the water filled it up. It looked like a little swimming pool with, a, with some cows floating in the middle of it. And then he prayed. And when he prayed, fire came down out of heaven, consumed everything. <clears throat> Finally, the people were convinced. And he said, put to death the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Asherah. Wouldn't you call that a great victory? Oh, he was so excited that he ran like 40 miles. And, 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 and what, a, what an incredible thing that has happened. And what, a, what an incredible celebration of, of a mighty man who had great faith and a great God. To see 1 Kings 18 is just absolutely phenomenal. How many of you have ever been there? You've seen God do great things. You've been so full of his Holy Spirit. You've experienced the outpour of his power. You've been like, whoa, I'll take on anybody. Have you been there? I hope for all of you that you get there. But there's a problem. We have chapter 19, and the story changes. The story changes quickly. And so we see this warrior, and I want to show you how a warrior becomes a wimp. Are you ready? This is how a warrior becomes a wimp. He needs rest. 
You know warriors for God can get tired. We're going to talk about all these in a moment, how we fix them. But here is Elijah, and he's tired. We see that Elijah was hungry, tired and hungry. We see that Elijah forgot what God had done. We see that Elijah had lost his focus upon God, and we see that Elijah was all alone. These five things were very present. Look at 1 Kings 19. Now Ahab, the king, told Jezebel, the queen, everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. Now I don't know about you, if, if, if God had just called down fire out of heaven, if he had made it rain after three years, if I saw all the people repent and come back to God, and saw all these prophets of Elijah put to the sword, I don't know about you, it seems only fitting that he would say, bring it on, Jesse! Come on! You got nothing, girl! But that's not what he does. We see that this warrior becomes a wimp. Instead of saying, bring it on, look at verse 3. Elijah was, say it, afraid. Afraid? And he ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. And while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. Ever feel like you're in the wilderness? That's what's going on with him. He came to a broom bush. He sat down under it and prayed that he might die. This is severe depression. This is a man, perhaps to the point of suicide. This is a man that had just seen great victory, had experienced one of the greatest outpours of God's power in the history of the world. And here, just shortly afterwards, he is battling depression to the place where he wants to die. And here's what he prays. I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. You know where his ancestors are by this time, don't you? They're dead. So listen to me, friends. Do not be surprised when after great victories, you feel like giving up. A few years ago in Glasgow, the Lord had blessed the church. We had started off with about 50 people. It had gone through a hard time. And we had grown. And, and we had outgrown the facility. And, and we, we built a brand new sanctuary. And everything was just amazing going towards that. We were raising the funds. The building was absolutely beautiful. And, and there was excitement. And the first day in that church, it was like God just poured out his Holy Spirit. It, it, was, it was like the Shekinah glory of God coming out. There were 600 people in that sanctuary. It was a magnificent time. And one of our elders stood in an elder meeting and he said, listen, we need to be aware. Because anytime God does something great, Satan's ready to try to come in and snatch it up. We warned our people. And sure enough, within just a few weeks, there was problem here and problem there. And, and, and we overcame it, but we weren't surprised by it. Don't be surprised when you go through a difficult time. Don't be surprised when you feel like throwing in the towel. As a preacher, almost every Monday, we're ready to quit. But thank God Wednesday comes along and life gets a little bit better. You need to know that life isn't always about the victories. There's times of great challenge, and we need to understand the problem. And so the question today is, how can a wimp return to being a warrior? So if you're taking notes today, we can find out from this passage what the problem was. Number one, we see that the problem was... He needed rest. We need rest. Will you say that with me? We need rest. Doesn't sound real spiritual, does it? I just need to go sleep for Jesus. Praise the Lord. As a matter of fact, I'm going to tell you there's two tools in the Christian life that are extremely valuable. You know what this is? Everybody say what this is. The Bible. There's a second tool, and I want you to get this down. It's behind the Bible. It's only second to the Bible. The second tool that you need in the Christian life is a good pillow and an adjustable mattress. Amen? We need rest. Look at old Elijah. Listen to what it says. Then he lay down under the bush, and did he, what did he do? He fell asleep. Now, I know some of you right now, that's exactly what you're doing. 
As a matter of fact, here you go, Mitch. You need that more than I do. He fell asleep. 6b, he ate and drank and then he fell asleep again. Verse 9, he went to a cave and he spent the night. Hey, here is, here is the first man cave ever. Elijah's going into his man cave. He's shutting the door. Everybody stay away. I'm going to sleep. I remember reading about Charles Stanley. Charles Stanley, a great pastor, been written so many books, has, a, has an international ministry. And Charles Stanley would go, he'd have a prayer closet in his office. And he would go in there, and every time he'd go in there to pray, he would fall asleep. And he'd feel like a real heathen. He felt so convicted. And finally, somebody said to him, brother, you need sleep. It's just as important as prayer. And so he brought a pillow into his prayer closet. And I think he's done pretty good, don't you? Still going in his 80s. And uh, there's an important lesson here. Rest is commanded. Say that with me. Rest is commanded. We see this in the very beginning. We see that one of the Ten Commandments is, remember what? Remember the Sabbath. Sabbath literally means rest. And what does rest mean? Cease from labor. Now, a lot of people today will say, hey, that Sabbath stuff, that's the law. The law went out the door when Jesus Christ came. And let me tell you something. Yes, the law went out, so you're not going to go to hell because you go mow your yard on a Sunday. But there is a principle that preceded the law. You remember what God did for the first six days of creation? He created. What did he do on the seventh day? He ceased from creating. There is a principle in place that if we don't honor and don't respect and don't follow, we will reap the harsh benefits from it. We need rest. I remember the old days growing up, growing up as a kid in the 70s, back in the old days. And what, what was open on a Sunday? Nothing. Now, the grocery store started to open up a little bit. You know what kind of shows, after football season was over, you know what kind of shows were on on Sundays? On one of the three channels? You know what was on? Bowling. Bowling. I can remember being so bored on Sundays, I would fall asleep. It's kind of the design, isn't it? How many of you remember going home and eating a big meal on Sundays and falling asleep? That's back in the old days when people used to fall asleep after church, not during church. <laughs> we have so filled up our world, now everything's open on Sundays. We never have a time to rest. We never have a time to get caught up. And so we take these days of rest that God has designed and we, we fill them up. Today we fill up our time of rest with all kinds of things, don't we? How many of you find yourself sitting there with this thing all the time? And you know that about the time you, how many of you know that about the time you fall off and take a nap, it buzzes? This happened to me yesterday. All right, got home from the car show. I was going to take a five-minute snooze, and bzz, bzz, bzz. Nothing like a bzz, bzz, bzz to ruin your nap. I know what you're thinking. Brother Tim, you're not real spiritual. You were going to take a nap. Yes, I am. God rested. As a matter of fact, look at Jesus. He's healing people. There's all these people lined up who need him. You know what he did? He went and took a nap in a boat. He got away from the people. All these, that's not spiritual. He's Jesus. If Jesus could do it, so can you and me. We need sleep, amen? Every week, you can look on every week on the major news magazines, on TV, every week. Just last week, another study came out. Americans are grossly undersleeping. And I don't know whether you need six hours, eight hours, ten hours, whatever you need. We need to rest. God designed it in the fabric of creation. It comes out of his very being. It is time that we start taking a nap. Can I get an amen? amen. Actually, it's not time. It'll be time here in about an hour. <laughs> this is based upon the nature of God. Now, let me give strong clarification right here. Rest comes after work. We need to teach our children they do not live for recreation. Recreation is there so that they can work again. God created us for a purpose, and it's not, listen to me, it's not recreation. God has jobs for each one of us, even in the Garden of Eden, in the perfection of creation. Adam and Eve had a job. 
And even when we see that we go to heaven, there will be responsibilities that we carry out. God created us for a purpose. Rest comes after work, but rest must come. We do not work so that we can rest. No, we don't live for the weekend. The weekend's there so that we might make it through the week. Because God has a job. I'll say that again. Your children should not live for recreation. We should not live for our naps. Our naps are there so that we might fulfill the call of God on our lives. Number two, we need refreshment. Will you say that with me? We need refreshment. Listen to what happens in 5b. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. What do you think he ate? Angel food cake, I'm guessing. Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some angel food cake. No, baked bread over hot coals and a jar of water. How cool is that? (laughs) Who cooked your dinner? Well, just an angel came down from heaven. By the way, you never complain when the angel cooks your dinner, all right? Man, how awesome was that? He's out in the middle of the wilderness. There is not a Hardee's there. And here is hot bread. Ooh, don't you love hot bread right out of the oven? Oh, that's making me hungry. And a cold jar of water. And so what? He was hungry. Do you know that when you're hungry, you don't do very good? How many of you notice that? It's like that Snickers commercial where you turn into a big grump. Like a, you know what I'm talking about? And how many of you notice that? I have to be careful. If I come up here and I, I try to preach without having something to drink, and I grab me just a little candy bar, a little snack, so that my blood sugar is good before I preach, then I'm going to fall asleep. <laughs> I'm going to fall asleep. Some of you are saying, brother, you should have eaten a little bit more. We have to understand that we need refreshment. Verse 7, the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat again. <laughs> Hallelujah. This time it was Mexican food. So he got up, ate some chips and sauce, had a drink. Strengthened by that food, he traveled for 40 days and 40 nights. Listen to the key line, strengthened by the food. Don't miss this. One of the greatest problems that we might experience in the spiritual life is that we're not eating right. How spiritual is eating right? Apparently it's very spiritual. Are you eating right? Are you, are you feeding yourself good, healthy food? Are you eating regularly? If, you, if you're struggling, maybe, we're, maybe it's just like the little children. You know when you have that sweet... I've watched Daniel's and Elizabeth's kids. I've watched them. Aren't they cute? Except for Lucas. I'm going to break his arm. They're, they're cute. And they're sweet. And they're fun. And, and they're a blessing. And, 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 and every once in a while, they'll get a little sideways. Hannah did this a lot, bro. And she'll still do it. I say, Hannah, what's wrong with you? I'm tired. I'm hungry. How many of you know that when you're tired and hungry, you're not your best? And so maybe to have a spiritual overflow of God in your life, you probably need to go to the, to the Chinese buffet for lunch today. All right. All sounds very good. Eating properly, regularly, keeping your body hydrated, staying away from things that would bring caffeine crashes and and, and sugar overloads. Uh, listen to me, friends. Our body, the Bible says, is a temple. Now, I want you to think of your body not as a building, but as a motor home. We're traveling all over the place, and we need to fuel the temple. Again, just like a sweet child can fall apart if they're hungry or tired, so can we. Maybe you're not experiencing the overflow of God in your life because you're not taking care of your temple. You need rest. You need refreshment. There's a third thing that he needed that a Sabbath provides, and that is we need time to reflect. Will you say that with me? I want you to get this. We need time to reflect. If you're constantly moving forward, if you're constantly trying to go to the next thing and the next thing, and it's day after day, moment after moment, there's a problem. Here's the problem. He had forgotten to look back and say, Woo! Had a smackdown with the prophets of Baal. The Asherah folks didn't stand a chance. Did you see that fire fall? Did you see that barbecue burn up? Man, God's good. Did you feel the rain after three years? Here is a problem. Look at it. 
And the word of the Lord came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Here's a chance for Elijah to say, Lord, you rocked it, man. You rocked it. But he doesn't. Look at verse 10. He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. They've torn down your altars and they put the prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left. Now they're going to kill me too. Man, what's going on? He is not reflecting on the blessings that God just brought. How many of you remember just a few weeks ago, my son Ken stood here in his pulpit and delivered what I thought was a really nice message. And he said, what you need to remember God's faithfulness in the past so that you will be faithful in the future. And that's exactly what we need to do. You know why I love Sundays? I love a time where I can just stop and I can look back on the week and I go, God, you're good. You know what I did this morning? That car show was fun. I ate two cheeseburgers yesterday. I was refreshed. And I look back and I think, Wednesday night was great. Like I think I enjoyed being with my wife and my daughter. I enjoyed that conversation with my son. Enjoy the times with my friends. Do you ever do that? Do you ever just take time to pause and thank God for what he's doing? Tennille, some exciting things happen in your life right now. New album coming out. By the way, you can pre-order that today. <laughs> you need to just stop sometimes and say, thank you, God, for where you're taking me, what you've done. That is such an important lesson. Listen to me. This is absolutely essential. Philippians 4.8 is one of my favorite verses. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. And the God, listen to me, and the God of peace will be with you. You want the overflow of God in your life? Stop and think about God's faithfulness. Don't sit there and think, oh, Jezebel wants to get me. You stop and say, God, you just rocked it. I remember your faithfulness, and I'm going to be faithful to you. Here was a time for Elijah to reflect. Do you, do you take any time? How about this? At the end of a day, we have a Sabbath where we come home. We might sit down at the dinner table. We might sit in our recliner and we just pause and we thank God for the blessings of that day. Once a week, we just end and cease our labors. And we have a time, not where we're busy, where we fill it up with all the other stuff, trying to make ourselves have fun, but where we just stop and we reflect and we thank God for his faithfulness. Do you do that? Is the God of peace lacking in your life? If he is then you need to pause and reflect on those things that are good, noble, pure, true, and praiseworthy. There's a fourth thing that we see here, and it's this. We need to refocus. Would you say it with me? We need to... That was really amazing. You see, I kind of pulled out there just to see if you were doing it, and you didn't. You let me down. I'm going to try it one more time. We need to... I want you to think of... Um, I want you to think of the karate kid, all right? You with me for a moment? You remember the little hammer? And he says, Daniel-san. What's that, Mr. Miyagi? You must say it. Focus. You must focus. Here, Elijah had lost focus. He had taken his eyes off of God, what God was going to do, and he had put his own been on things. He thought that all of Israel was going to turn. He was disappointed. His expectations were unmet. And we see here what God does. Verse 11. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Woo! How awesome would that be? You need to catch a fresh glimpse of God. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountain apart, shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak 
over his face and went out and stood in the mouth of the cave. Oh, Susanna Wesley, mother of 14 kids. There were times where she would just pull her cloak over her head and if a kid bothered her while the cloak was over her head, that kid would get a severe punishment. <coughs> Why? Because there's times we need to refocus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the, in the light of his glory and grace. Do you ever take time where you just pause and you focus on the magnificence of God? Friends, that's what Sunday should do. The church of Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3 had gone astray. They're the church that was called lukewarm. And they are told to buy eye salve to spread on their eyes and to take off. And after that, eye salve left their eyes, then they could see clearly. We need to do that together. Oh, God, reveal if there's any evil way in me. Help me to see again your power and your majesty and your glory. Help me to see your plan and help me to gain laser-like focus on what it is you want me to do. Are you doing that each week? Are you doing that each day? Getting things back in focus. You want the overflow of your life, of God in your life? Focus on him. Finding number five. We need reinforcements. Don't miss this. We talked about God's math here just a couple weeks ago. This is absolutely, extremely important. We see here, a voice said to him, what are you up to, Elijah? And he goes through the whole spiel again. I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put the prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. He said this before. There's still something missing. And I want you to understand today, you will never experience the overflow of God in your life if you feel like you're all alone. One of the great things about taking a Sabbath and coming together to worship is we're reminded we're in this together. And I cannot tell you again how important it has been for me in my life whenever I'm tired, whenever I'm worn out, whenever I'm exhausted to have friends who call, who encourage, who pray for, who lift me up. Verse 15, the Lord said to him, go back the way you came and go to the desert, desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Haziel king over Aram. Also anoint Yehu son of Nimshi king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Mahola, to succeed you as prophet. Yehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Haziel. Elisha will put to death any who escape the sword of Yehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. You see what's happening here? God is assuring him and reminding him he is not alone. Hey, you're going to build a group. We're going to call it the Super Friends. And you're all going to be together. and You've got to be a mighty force for God. You cannot live and walk alone in the Christian life and succeed. You must have somebody who's there to support you. We see that when Moses was trying to hold up his rod, they brought in a rock where he could sit down and two different guys held up his hands so that he could make it. Over and over again in scripture, we see that it's not good to be alone. We need help. And so Elisha had stood alone, but you cannot stand alone for long. You've got to have people with you. That's another reason why I love Sundays. I love Wednesdays. I love every time we get together, whether it's formally as a church or simply informally as people who are the church. We need time to gather our forces back together. No man or woman can go it alone in the Christian life and experience God's bounty. You can't experience God's overflow alone. As we talked about last week, we need one another. Christians are commanded not to forsake the assembling of themselves together. Regular attendance should lead to regular relationships. And relationships, listen to me friends, lead to power in the Christian life. Rodney, we can't make it alone, can we? We've got to have friends. We can't do this by ourselves. And so listen to me again. We need time to rest. Go home. Take a nap. When you get home in the evenings, give yourself a break. We need time to refresh. Eat right. Don't take things into your body that would 
mess you up. We need time to reflect, time to look back and thank God for his faithfulness, as Ken preached. We need to stop and think about all the good things he's done. How many of you can just pour out thousands of things that God has done? And how easy it is to forget them. You need time to just stop, write them down, list them, talk about all that he's done. We should, the Bible says, forget not all his benefits. Take time every day, every week, maybe even an hour to refocus, to look for God and maybe to hear him in that still, small voice. If you don't get quiet, you can't hear. Find me. Make sure that you're not trying to live this Christian life alone. You've got to have friends. You need to call upon friends. You might have a victory here or there by yourself, but it's not going to last long. If Elijah needed friends, I guarantee you, you and I need each other. Are you trying to live it alone? That's a lot of R's, five R's. But I pray as we remember those, reflect on those, think about those and live those out that we would experience the bountiful overflow of God in our lives and that we would once again be warriors, not wimps. Father God, thank you for this picture of Elijah, for your faithfulness to him. We see ourselves in him. Sometimes we experience great victory through what you've done and then sometimes we're absolute wimps thinking that we're not going to make it another day. Father, help us to Turn our eyes upon you. Help us to refocus, to rest, to renew, to refresh. Father, help us to, help us to be engaged with other people as we have reinforcements. God, may we experience your overflow, not to be wimps, but to be warriors in your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Enjoy community hour.